Good morning. Uh, a warm welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first event in the new year of our Let's Talk Data Learning Series, so I'm really excited. We're really pleased to host this uh, discussion, SDGs, the data story, uh, in connection to the recently launched uh, World Bank Atlas of the Development Data Goals. I'm so honored uh, to join you as the moderator and to see many of our partners who made this atlas ha happen uh, have been able to, uh, to join us. So really welcome. Today, what we'll do is that we'll start with a brief conversation with our uh, World Bank Group Chief Economist, Carmen Reinhardt, to talk about data in times of crisis. And then we will have a short presentation of the SDG Atlas by my colleagues Umar Sarajin, manager of the World Bank's data uh, group. And then we will open up to have a lively panel discussion with four brilliant panelists from around the world to dis discuss the SDG data landscape and the importance of translating data into insights and decisions. I will introduce our panelists shortly. Let's start first with uh, uh, our uh, chief economist, Carmen. Carmen, really, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. I know you're so busy leading the uh, data uh, debt initiative uh, at the bank uh, and with all the other partners, uh, but it's so important for you to be with us because what's the time for us to discuss data in time of crisis? Right now, we're still in the middle of the global uh, pandemic caused by COVID-19. So why we talk about sustainable development goals right now? since we have so many urgent needs to deal with. What's your take on that? Uh, well, I think there's always a good time to talk about sustainable development goals. Uh, and, and, and we can elaborate on this later, but because, you know, the setbacks uh, that we are seeing to our, you know, agreed upon uh, desirable development goals. Uh, but a, sp a, a particular issue that I think highlights the importance of talking about the development goals, sustainable development goals here and now, is governments are indeed facing uh, an emergency situation. We're all aware of the health situation but the health situation has morphed into an economic crisis uh, with associated hardships in many of the poorest countries. There's another layer, which is also a debt crisis, limited fiscal capacity to respond to the pandemic needs. And so the development goals is is, is is precisely as the term states and goal, and it's important not to lose sight uh, of the, uh, the the kinds of uh, milestones uh, that you know allow for for development, which can get lost in the emergency of dealing with a crisis. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the fact that many of these countries are going to be facing important trade-offs, important, very difficult decisions as they deal with the, the pandemic, with limited fiscal space, uh, with, you know, debt problems, uh, it's important not to lose sight, um, not only of the uh, goals, but also what this pandemic has done uh, in terms of, of setbacks. Sorry. Um, no, thank you, Carmen, for reminding us how important it is for us to keep our eyes on balancing the immediate urgent need 
with the long-term goals so that our policies and actions uh, around recovery and rebuild will be really on the track to, to, to help us uh, uh, get back on track to achieve the longer-term uh, development goals. So thank you so much. It, it's amazing to see that you joined us, you joined VAC right when the global pan pandemic started to cause wide-ranging, cascading consequences, um, but you stepped right into it and, and, and provided the intellectual leadership uh, for the debt service suspension initiative. Um, at this time, the SDG was, uh, Atlas was being prepared to highlight some of the key areas most affected by the pandemic. In your view, what are some of the most concerning setbacks brought on by the pandemic that we really need to focus on so that we will have a healthy recovery to, the, uh, uh, to our path to achieve the SDGs? Uh, you know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I've used the word setback, uh, which is, you know, it weighs very heavily, uh, I think, right now on, on you know, the, the developing and emerging world because the pandemic's an exceptionally regressive shock. Mm. It's regressive within countries. It's affected the lower income households with less assets, with less social safety net. It's affected the smaller businesses that have, again, less re re recourse mm -hmm. to stay afloat, especially the longer the shutdowns last, the more that we have to uh, go back to renewed shutdowns the more the hardship and that hardship is, as I said, has been very unequally distributed within countries. Mm -hmm. It's also been exceptionally unequal across countries. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, this is an issue we all know, and I had alluded to in my earlier remarks, mm -hmm. the developing world in varying degrees, but clearly they don't have the resources, they don't have the right. firepower. Right. Uh, to offset the adverse effects of the shocks. They can't do the large scale fiscal stimulus to really fully uh, complement lost income, lost employment. Uh, you know, countries that depend on tourism, countries that have depended on commodity prices, which also have been very depressed throughout all of this. These are big unequal effects. So we've seen setbacks in poverty, as, as, as you know, we documented at the bank, we're seeing the first spikes mm -hmm. since the late 1990s in poverty rates. Uh, you know, uh, I think there are all manner of concerns on food security and actual, the you know, hunger. Uh, we've seen setbacks on education, you know, particularly disturbing also I alluded to already the unequal uh, impact of the crisis across income levels and across countries and in income levels, but it's also an unequal crisis across gender mm. uh, with women disproportionately affected. And so setbacks uh, towards gender equality and girls' education. So, you know, I don't want to be, uh, you know, sound like like really depressing but these are really big challenges mm -hmm. that documenting these and keeping this in the forefront uh of the policy makers minds is very important uh not to lose sight of that and and those unfortunate setbacks are not it's not an exhaustive list that i've gone through but i've highlighted yeah. i think uh, some of the main ones yeah thank you so much you know carmen it's really a pleasure working under you um, because you are such a passionate working advocate. Working with me, working with me. <laughs> working with you. No, seriously, because you're such a passionate advocate for the most vulnerable and for really 
keep on reminding our policymakers where we should really focus on, and and especially in this uh, crisis time, that where the policies uh, decision need to be made in order to really make sure that uh, those people are not further left behind. So thank you so much. Another thing that I really enjoyed working with you is that you are also a big advocate for better data and for better communicating uh, with data to influence the development of thinking and policy making. So I, I'm really, really glad. But now, you know, I know that I'm very proud of how the Atlas has taken a very creative approach to tell stories about the most surprising issues in development. So my next question to you may be a bit biased. Uh, do you find the Atlas has done a good job? And how useful is it uh, in adopting this new creative approach to inform a wider audience about SDG progress and setbacks? Uh, look, I, and again, <laughs> it, I'm also biased. <laughs> but, uh, let's, let's get that. Uh, uh, I think it's done an excellent job. Uh, I think outreach uh, is extremely important. I think outreach also, uh, you know, in terms of education, I, you know, I came to the bank from a public policy school and, you know, in a public policy setting, uh, I think uh, students that come from developing country backgrounds perhaps are already more attuned to many of the issues flagged, but students that come from advanced economies often are even stunned, uh, you know, irrespective of very sophisticated backgrounds in many of them. Uh, so, so I think outreach, and that's one dimension. I think another very important dimension, which I'm hoping is gathering momentum, is social investing. Right. Uh, you know, creating a sense of, of you know, the, the, the importance for, for investors, for financial markets, uh, to, to, to internalize that their investment decisions have, you know, real time uh, global impacts. And so I think the outreach, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, ranging from, from the, you know, generation that is still being shaped to uh, the practitioners and, and to, to the private community, I think it's very important. So, you know, those stories that you're telling are very important. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, and thank you for sharing with us all those inspiring thoughts. And I know you have to leave for another meeting, but really we're grateful that you join us to open up this discussion. So thank you so much. We'll carry on with the same uh, enthusiasm. My, my pleasure to be here. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Now let's move to Umar who will be presenting to us the SDG Atlas 2020. Thank you, Aishan. <clears throat> Thank you, Carmen, for that uh, great discussion. I'll now stop my uh, video and uh, share my presentation with you. So, um, Aishan, you can see? Yes, yes, we can see. So, um, the Atlas is uh, about communicating complex knowledge on international development in an accessible manner. So, the bank has actually done atlases since 1966. And I wasn't even born then. Huh? And in 1966, you can see these uh, hand-drawn maps with just two statistics, uh, GDP per capita and population. And look at Italy here, huh? looking like a stylish boot. Over the next 50 years, we evolved a lot, especially when uh, SDGs came around. The bank was very actively engaged in the UN process of how to measure the SDGs. And from this engagement, it became clear to us that SDGs were inclusive, not only in its agenda of no one bet, uh, left behind, but also in terms of including many stakeholders in the formulation of the goals. This really inspired me. It inspired all of us. And, and we started thinking about how to communicate about the goals in a more inclusive manner. 
And uh, this resulted in 2017 and 2018 atlases. And actually we produced it with input from the whole of the bank. And uh, now uh, this uh, is of course uh, complementary to the work that the UN does because the official and definitive SDG monitoring report is published by the UN and this is an extremely popular publication. Now the world has been changing uh, very fast and to meet the moment, we changed again in 2020. We introduced innovative visualizations and interactive storytelling, uh, scrolly telling, drawing inspiration from the data journalism approaches of outlets like New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I'll just give you one anecdote. Um, when I showed the 2018 Atlas to the then chief economist of the bank, she really appreciated the product. And uh, very excited, I showed it to her colleague, another professor who is my friend. And he said, um, wow, this is amazing. I will show it to my daughter. And his daughter is an eighth grader. But that's who we try to reach, right? From the young student to the chief economist, policymakers, academics, media people, classrooms, anyone who is interested in development. The Atlas covers uh, 17 goals and it's a large canvas. Huh? And, and we have um, a lot of stories there. I will just now give you the actual web experience. So this is our homepage and uh, we have 17 chapters here, discussions on um, all of the goals. So I'll just start um, discussing quality education, which is a SDG goal four. Now, a measure of quality education developed by UIS and the World Bank called learning poverty considers children learning poor if by the end of primary school, they are unable to read and understand a simple text. So imagine that we place all the children from low and middle income countries who are expected to be at the end of primary school in this rectangle. The ones in the blue area are not learning poor, while the ones in the brown area are learning poor. You will notice that over half the children in low and middle income countries are learning poor. Now, the learning poor can be broken into um, two groups. Children who are in school but cannot read at a minimum proficiency level, this is shown in green in the visualization. This makes up about 40% of all children. And children who are out of school, shown in red, another 10% of children. So you see that of the learning poor, a vast majority are in school, implying that school enrollment alone is insufficient. Now these figures, they vary greatly by region. So in four regions of the world, huh? Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia and Latin America and Caribbean, over half the children are learning poor. This was astonishing to me. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, nine in 10 children are learning poor. This is equivalent to more than 100 million children. Now, COVID has actually impacted uh, learning poverty. So our colleagues in the education team have um, shown that school closures combined with low effectiveness in mitigating the crisis could increase global learning poverty by 10 percentage points, up from 53 to 63%. And in the Atlas, we talk a lot about how COVID has impacted many other SDGs global poverty, which went up for the first time in almost 25 years. Hunger is up. We also discuss how COVID has affected health SDGs. And uh, remittances have actually been hit hard. By 2021, remittance flows are expected to fall by 14%. So as a global community, we really do have our work cut out for us to get back on track. So I'll now move to um, another SDG. Uh, a bit different flavor. This is uh, one of my favorites. So let's see how the world looks from uh, up above at night. So for this visual, we compare lights in one location to lights in another location. So to the left, you will see it's uh, Washington DC, the 150 kilometer radius uh, around Washington DC. And to the right, it's for Katakwi, Uganda. Now, according to official estimates, 100% of people in the US have access to electricity and 43% have it in Uganda. 
But um, this visual is even starker, right? It shows Katakwi far darker than Washington DC. So this is the uh, kind of the benefit of granular data. We get more insight from it. This is uh, based on NASA and uh, NOAA uh, data. And this is an interactive uh, map, by the way. See, you can move the globe around and you can also click in any other place to find other comparators. So now um, looking at the earth from space brings us again to the environment. And the SDGs are nothing uh, without the environment, be it the SDG goals on sustainable consumption, land, oceans, or climate change. And uh, I could talk about forests, but uh, which is part of SDG 15, but my colleagues often tell me that I can't see the forest for the trees. And uh, I'll talk about uh, oceans, though um, I do feel a bit out of my depth about oceans also. But um, so we actually use uh, a world map centered on oceans. And uh, this is kind of a projection that we use because it can understand oceans better. And here we use ocean maps to highlight some challenges facing the world, world seas today. And darker colors imply greater uh, stress. So overfishing, for example, bottom trawling, indiscriminately catching everything that comes your way, damages uh, seafloor ecosystems. And you can see the dark uh, pink colors there. Then uh, if we move to intensive shipping, this damages marine environments, also through release of chemicals, transfer of invasive species, dumping of wastes, and uh, so on. So if you add uh, many of these uh, stressors, you end up with a cumulative picture where 98% of global oceans are affected by multiple stressors. Huh? So uh, Aishan, I could really go on for a bit longer, but I will end here. I'll stop my video. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, I'll start my video. And uh, I just wanted to end uh, by giving a shout out to the great team that produced it. Uh, team leaders were Florina Pirlia, Divyan Shivadva, Andrew Whitby, and a huge team. Um, they, they produced it uh, and uh, from the rest of the bank. And just, uh, I guess, uh, one last thing is that the SDGs are uh, based on the fundamental principles of statistics. And Stefan Schweinfest will uh, touch on them. So I guess our job is to uh, put the fun in the fundamental principles of statistics. <laughs> and, uh, and then also the mental, Aishan, also the mental. Huh? Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Umar, for this excellent uh, presentation. The more I, I see uh, this product, the more proud I am of the team you led to, to produce this and also the partnership. Uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, enjoyed uh, in, in doing this together. So thank you so much. Now, as promised, let's turn to our wonderful panelists. Uh, before we start the dis discussion uh, with you, uh, I want to encourage any viewers uh, with questions to enter them into the chat. So we, if we have time, we'll uh, come to them at the end of the panel discussion. Um, to start, uh, let me first come to Blessing Omagu, who is the deputy director at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the heads of its Goalkeepers Initiative. So Blessing, it's wonderful to have you here. You know, the 2020 Goalkeepers Report and SDG Atlas uh, share a lot in common. They're both full of actionable data and thoughtful analysis. And your report, the Goalkeepers Report, particularly focused on how the COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted global progress on the SDGs. Um, and and I, I really would like you to share with your vision of how such report as the goalkeepers and SDGs, uh, whom are we trying to reach, first of all, and how do you think they should uh, use the report and benefit from them? Well, thank you so much for having me. And I agree, I was going through the SDG Atlas and I was just seeing so many similarities. I think our messages were very similar. So it's really exciting to see a lot of synergy. Um, and I think that probably our, our intentions are the same. Um, in the past, the goalkeepers report has really celebrated success and progress. Um, we were making progress, for example, on, on poverty indicators that the SDG outlets indicates. And then last year happened and we had this really huge regression. And so our report last year was different. 
Um, it really was showing what are the what are the shocking changes that have happened, what are the regressions that have happened. And we're hoping it will reach about three groups of people. One is leaders and decision makers. It's really important right now that uh, decision makers, be it in government, be it in multilateral institutions, I'm sure many of the people who are watching this today have this data on hand to guide their investments, to guide their policy decisions. Um, it's also for advocates, for people who are passionate about holding government accountable, holding organizations accountable, and just ensuring transparency in processes. We're hoping that advocates will use this data as a tool. And then for change makers, one of the fantastic things about goalkeepers is it brings together so many incredible kinds of people from different sectors who are doing work on the SDGs in different ways. And so we hope that they will use this data as they design their programs and their innovations. But really excited just to see what the SDG Atlas is doing and to see that there's so much synergy and to think about how we can continue to explore collaboration and synergy. So thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, I really enjoyed your tagline. Um, progress is possible, but not inevitable. It really keep our mind onto what we need to focus on, especially in a time of crisis, that how we should really inform our policymakers with the right kind of data so that we can design the right policies. So thank you so much. I'll come back to you. So and now let's uh, let's come to uh, Mr. Shekhar Shah, Director General of the National Council of Applied Economic Research in India. Uh, Mr. Shah, you are the head of the largest think tank in India. Um, you are active in advising and uh, exchanging views with the government, policymakers, and the public. And as a former uh, World Bank colleague, uh, you have unique insight into how to tell the SDG story. So how do you see a publication like the SDG Atlas as being useful for policymakers and politicians in, in, in your real practice? And how can we do better to help turn data into uh, decisions? Thank you, Haishan, for, uh, and Umar for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first thing that hit uh, us when we looked at the a new SDG Atlas is just the quantum leap that uh, the data group has done in terms of uh, how to make data more persuasive, how to make it communicate complexity, how to capture the spatial dimensions of data, the intertemporal dimensions of data. And I'm so glad to see Susanna Gable here because she's uh, sitting in at Stockholm, I assume, and we always think of Hans Rosling as yeah. the man who transformed our thinking about what data does. And of course, given my age, I go back to Edward Tufte and the kind of work that he used to do uh, with this famous Napoleonic yeah. War graph that yeah. you're all familiar yeah. with. So I think the, the tremendous aspect of data visualization and what this group is doing and what indeed the previous 2017 and 18 data atlases did is that they make data come alive. And politicians and policymakers with extremely limited amounts of time simply do not have the ability to wade through paragraph to paragraph of text, irrespective of how well written it is. So it's really imperative that in this pandemic age, when attention spans are so short simply because there's so much to do, mm -hmm. that we really pinpoint these aspects and come across is as definitively and as persuasively as possible especially when data becomes interactive. Uh, and it's great that they are following the lead of the New York Times, which I think is absolutely the best in the world in terms of what they've done with pandemic related data. But when you make data interactive, then you've got a natural kind of scenario uh, situation that you can play with. And policymakers ask you a really serious question. And if you're well prepared, you say, just hold on for a second. I'm going to run the scenario on my data and yeah. boom, you see something emerge that just completely blows their mind. And they tell you, this is right. They tell their assistant, we need to look at this and let's invest in this or let's get Mr. Shah or his colleagues to come in and tell us more about it. I think the power of data is just being realized. And with the incredible difficulties that most parts of the world are and with the great divergence that we are seeing that uh, Carmen has talked about, certainly Gita Gopinath across the street from has talked about we need to be very conscious that we deploy data in the best possible way to get leaders in developing countries to think about what they are doing right, what they are doing wrong, and to be able to compare what other countries are doing. As we know, 
some 24% of GDP is roughly the number that the advanced economies have deployed in terms of income support. The average for EMDs, emerging market economies, is 2%. And being able to see and play out the impacts of that in terms of social protection, in terms of the demand push that, that this data can give, is incredibly powerful and mm. really important for us to do. So that's why I think what you guys are doing is just absolutely great. Thank you so much. You know, it means so much to us to to get your nod on, on this product, and it's just really encourage us to continue to innovate uh, and do better. So thank you so much. Um, you acknowledge Susanna, and so let me turn to Susanna. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Susanna is uh, the chief economist of uh, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, the famous CEDA, and I, I need to outright acknowledge the 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 contribution um, of CEDA to the World Bank SDG Partnerships Partnership Fund, which supported us in, uh, in investing in producing this product. So thank you so much uh, with that. But beyond that, um, I want to really turn to you to the fact that you have been studying uh, economic crisis throughout your career. And uh, this pandemic has really reinforced the critical importance of data-driven decision-making, which you have repeatedly uh, stressed is, is so important, uh, how we should uh, help define the development narrative with, inf with the real power of data um, and the, the right use of data to inform uh, the decision making. So in that context, I'd love to hear from you. How can bilateral donors like CEDA and the World Bank more effectively convey data and analysis, as well as better enable governments to use this data to support resilient recovery from the uh, COVID pandemic, but also uh, get back on track to achieve the SDGs? Well, thank you so much for, for having me, for, uh, first of all, and um, walking in the footsteps of uh, Hans Rosling is uh, certainly difficult, but I think you 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 would make him very proud uh, if he saw this, uh, this atlas. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to raise was um, that others also have touched upon is this uh, the storytelling part of the SDG Atlas that's uh, incredibly important. Uh, and we know that everyone makes up their stories to understand the world, no matter how much data is out there or how much fact-based uh, storytelling we, we have. And I think we can be very comfortable uh, in thinking that the world uh, it works like we researchers, we uh, do the uh, data uh, production and we do the objective analysis and then we leave it to the policymakers to do the recommendations and the policy decisions and to media to do the storytelling so it reaches everyone uh, everyone else. But we know uh, that that's not the case and when it's too fragmented the way from facts to story um, we, we have too many uh, bad examples on what can happen in that case. And I think uh, at the bank, when uh, no, the knowledge production or the knowledge products that you, you produce um, are mostly seen as part of the pa like a loan package, then uh, it's mainly the client uh, that you have in mind as, as the um, user. Uh, but when you see the knowledge product, uh, as a standalone uh, contribution to development, then suddenly you have the government, you have the business owners, you have the development corporations, uh, any citizen as the client. And with that, storytelling is certainly the business of the World Bank as well. And I think this SDG Atlas is just a fantastic contribution to, to that part of, uh, of uh, the World Bank mandate. Uh, and then another uh, aspect that I wanted to highlight was this multi-dimensional uh, uh, approach of the, the whole SDG Atlas. Uh, and uh, Cameron was also talking about it, uh, the, uh, the importance of not losing sight of the, where we want to be in the end. Uh, I think it's, it's, partly that we keep with the long-term goals, that it's important that you have this multidimensional approach, but also 
in short, short in a shorter term uh, and how we deal with the crisis because COVID has shown us very clearly that if we don't look at data and evidence in a multidimensional way, uh, we, can, we can't stand, uh, stand against crisis as uh, resilient uh, as we could otherwise. And I think this SDG Atlas, Atlas doesn't shy away from that, but tells stories that also show how the different goals are interact, interacting with each other. And so that's right. extremely important. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us on, on, on the criticality of, of looking at development from its multidimensional uh, 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 nature, but also uh, really try to work together to improve our measurement and approaches towards uh, capturing that multi-dimensionality. Uh, now, let me turn to Stefan. Uh, Stefan Schrenfest is the director of the United Nations Statistics Division. He's my long-term partner <laughs> in, in the statistical uh, community and also a great friend. And, uh, and when it comes to SDGs, uh, of course, UN and the World Banks uh, have been strong partners partners on SDG monitoring and communication. So, um, Stefan, we are indeed in the decade of action uh, as we have only nine some years left to achieve the SDGs. So what insight can we gain on achieving the SDGs through initiatives such as the SDG Atlas and your own report, um, our official report on the SDG progress? Now, hello everybody. And it's always great to be with you, Haishan and Uma and your team. and. Uh, Thank you, Umar, for reminding us that fundamental principles starts with fun. Uh, I don't, uh, and I can take that thought even a little bit further. I just realized that the UN is also in the word fun, and uh, it doesn't happen very often that I start my working day smiling, but you always make it happen. And of course, Haishan and I, we work very closely together. We went to statistical kindergarten together. So uh, World Bank and UN are well uh, connected on many topics. But what I really like here is uh, that we are talking not only about monitoring, but also communication. I think this is very important. We work for statistical office, so they are primarily concerned with the production of information. But then, of course, it is important to also communicate the information and bring it to the right users. And users, there are plenty of users. There are the very high level official users like I have to serve the General Assembly and give them an authoritative report every year on the status of the SDGs. And we work very closely with the national statistical offices and 40 international agencies. And we produce our SDG report uh, which is, of course, based on our SDG database. But that's a very specific audience that we have in mind. The audience to make the SDGs happen, of course, we need a lot more people than just the General Assembly or the politicians. We need the the thinkers, the, the uh, researchers, the citizens, everybody at all levels. So it was clear that when we launched a very uh, ambitious program like the SDGs, that there would be many reports at the local, national, regional, global, sectoral level. So, and I think this every report adds a perspective. And the SDG Atlas, I really love it for 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 two for two uh, fundamental reasons. First of all, you bring the geospatial and the statistical together. This is, of course, something I've always been advocating. And it is important that we understand where things are happening. And with the beautiful example that Uma showed, uh, it is the, the, the appealing power of geography. And of course, geography also tells us um, that we don't leave anybody uh, behind, that we see the distributional aspects much better than just by looking at numbers and data and official statistics and so. And then, of course, the other, the reason why I really like the Atlas is such an appealing and visually friendly uh, presentation. And it helps us to reach all of these other people, the eight-year-old daughter that you were talking about. And we need everybody on board in order to get the, to achieve the SDGs. So, I mean, not only does the Atlas help us to disseminate evidence, as we all do, it really raises awareness about the goals and what still needs to be done. <laughs> I think you're muted, Haishan. 
sorry, um, trying to avoid uh, the dog barking. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, definitely, we'll continue our strong partnership. Uh, it's it's really wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we still have some time, so let's go to another round of questions. And in meanwhile, we have received some questions uh, from online uh, uh, viewers and uh, uh, part participants. So I might wave into some of the questions to our to our panelists. So now let me come back to blessing. Um, blessing, you know, you in the goalkeepers report made it very clear, you know, what we do now collectively uh, to combat the pandemic and jumpstart the global economy, uh, economic recovery is really mission critical for uh, paving the way to achieve the, uh, put us back on the, uh, the achieving the SDGs. So what do you see as the major uh, urge, uh, urgent priorities for low and middle income countries in particular in this regard? So very briefly, <laughs> it's a big question, but very brief <laughs> answer. Well, Thank you. As succinct as possible. I think one quick thing is this pandemic has really shed light on the false binary between high income versus lower middle income countries, developing versus developed. We've seen levels of poverty here in the U.S. where I live that mirror levels of poverty in Nigeria where I'm from. We've seen health um, structures that, that need a lot of work in the U.S. that we see in parts of Nigeria and where I'm from. So it's just it's, it's an interesting thing to think in this time about what that binary is and if it still holds in a post-COVID world. Um, that being said, and I should add one more thing is in our report for, for um, this year, we talked about how in America, about 46% of Black and Latinx people couldn't even afford their rent in August. So again, you mm. see the poverty levels here are high. But that being said, I think a strong health response is the best stimulus to economic recovery. Um, mm. Healthy economies cannot be created or sustained without healthy people. Um, and I think global cooperation will be key in ensuring mm. equitable distribution of this vaccine. And that equitable distribution is so key, um, as the SDG Atlas um, points out, out-of-pocket payments are huge barriers in many LMICs. Um, I was part of a movement a couple of years ago to think about how we encourage and, and advocate for government investments in basic health care because of low, uh, low, levels of out of, um, low levels of support for out-of-pocket payments and things like that. And so I think that thinking about global cooperation around equitable vaccine distribution will be key. I think ensuring international financing to help LMICs, which the World Bank and others have been critical for, will also be key. And timely data to ensure that these investments are being guided well. For example, when we think about women, we need a lot of gender disaggregated data. Um, it's no secret to anyone probably who is listening to this on this call how women have been impacted by the virus and by the pandemic and how jobs have become vulnerable, how unpaid work has increased. And so we need women who are on COVID response teams. We need data to support these kinds of investments. So I think between data, between investments and thinking about how to really think about vulnerable populations that will be key in, in upcoming months and years. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. No, just just as a quick follow up, because as you speak, I received a question online. <clears throat> uh, one of our participants was asking, "What is SDG in one sentence, uh, and and what magic SDG is going to bring to help the needy?" I guess you have been really focusing on that. So, but in in, in couple of sentence, can you respond to this question? Sure. In one sentence, the SDGs are the goals that the world leaders agreed to in 2015 to make the world a better place by 2013. There are 17 goals and short story, we want to make the world a better place and this is how we do them. And I think the magic of the SDGs really is that it gives us a global framework. It makes us realize that here is a global way forward to get to those goals. It really unites the world. And I think one of the things that COVID did is it showed us how everything collides into everything, how needs here are needs there and how one kind of failure here impacts another failure in other parts of the world. And so these SDGs really give us a chance to think about connections. Um, it's interesting, we think sometimes in binaries that there's poverty, SDG one, and there's hunger. But many times people are experiencing many needs at the same time. And so the SDGs give us a chance to think about the interconnectedness of response. And so I, I, I thought one sentence, but hopefully it provides some answers. Um, around. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, now let's go to uh, Shekhar. You have really suggested that to truly be persuasive and support transformations, publication as, as the SDG Atlas uh, need to really have a wider reach. That meant that we really need to 
do better uh, to increase the um, uh, the statistical literacy of both our policymakers and our general public. So, what do you think uh, institutions as such as the World Bank need to do better? I go back to when I last was uh, working in DEC, uh, your part of the world in the bank, and we did the World Development Report on making services work for poor people. And you know, given the level of technology, I still go back and marvel at the graphs we produced then. But there was this very important uh, symbolic representation of the accountability triangle, as we used to call it, uh, with clients, uh, uh, with, with policymakers at the top and providers and teachers and then citizens. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, this is all about accountability. Data visualized well can hold policymakers and providers and citizens accountable. And I think that has to be the mission behind this whole idea of what the bank does and what the bank then espouses. Uh, so I'd highly recommend uh, taking that kind of accountability approach. And that speaks to also the truth that data must always provide. Of course, data can be used, as Susanna was saying, to tell lies as well. And, and therein lies the ethics of data visualization and, and data storytelling. I think that's truly very, very uh, important in this regard. I'd also like to say that um, the way in which the bank itself presents its work, whether it's uh, technical assistance or whether it's uh, economic and sector work uh, or whether it's really just loan documents, there's just a great deal of creativity that can be brought to the idea of how data can be persuasive. And I'd like to say that, and indeed, Umar and I have been discussing this a little bit. Um, I think uh, there should be technical assistance in, in, in data. That, uh, and it's not just what the bank does in terms of TA or loans to statistical agencies, but really a think tank like mine would benefit greatly from a very strong relationship with Umar's group. Where, for example, when we present to the prime minister, the kind of quarterly update which we've been doing uh, and his economic council, we use the best data techniques in the world to be able to convey very sharply and very quickly something that we are telling these six or seven members of this council who then report to the prime minister. Mm. I think that's a great opportunity for creating the data literacy that I think uh, the bank can actually do. And the same holds, by the way, for the fund, because yeah. they also produce, we just, I just came off a, Fantastic lecture by Gita Gopina. And, I see. You know, her, her, her visualization of the data and the IMF teams is really super. So I think we've just raised the ante on this. I think the bank should keep pushing and driving the techniques and the data analysis and the visualization down to client countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for that uh, strong uh, recommendation. But now let's change gear a little bit. Uh, Shekhar, are you still there? Are you still connected? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Sorry. No, just uh, I received another question that I might throw it at you. Um, but um, the question is a bit long, but you, you can be very short. <laughs> it's um, the question is our analysis of ESG factors in relation to sovereign bonds has shown that including these factors in index indi indicators or indexes can actually drive capital away from lower income countries which need investment to meet their SDGs. So how can we be sure that incentives for impact investors are aligned with SDGs? That's a tall question. It's, it's a huge gets, question. Maybe maybe I will to, I will come back to you later if if we could I, uh, address. Yeah, please. Can I just say uh, I, 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 in classic uh, media management style, I'll change the question around to give the message that I actually do want to give, which is that I think there's a great opportunity for Umar and his group and Faisha, uh, uh, Aisha, you to take the SDG Atlas and produce an update because there's now going to be very difficult to reach the SDGs by 2030 with what we've just gone through. And the idea of an update, a, 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 a COVID update to the athletes, I know it's going to be hard work, but what does this mean and how are your graphs and your visualization going to be affected is I think going to be incredibly powerful for the whole world of data. So I would highly recommend that you do this. I know this doesn't answer your question. But in a roundabout way, I think it does say, how does data prepare us better for this post-pandemic world? 
Right. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, on that note. Now, uh, let's turn to Susanna. Susanna, you are big and CEDA is big uh, uh, on uh, supporting countries, uh, especially lower income countries to build the capacity. In this case, is to build the capacity in producing and use data. So in that regard, um, how can we uh, uh, partnership uh, support developing countries in building such capacity uh, in use and produce data more effectively as data driven policy making has become clearly during this pandemic uh, 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 much more important than ever. Yeah, thank you. It, it's very true that uh, uh, CEDA holds the capacity building in countries very uh, close to our heart. I think it related to what we're talking about now. I. I I think two important points, and one is we've seen during COVID now the the urge for uh, data as the crisis develops, and uh, we need information to take fact based decisions. Uh, so there's been an incredible uh, partnership around the world uh, of agencies exchanging data and uh, and uh, knowledge and uh, and so on and ideas. Uh, and uh, the bank's high frequency data in terms of uh, firms and households has been uh, incredibly helpful. So in terms of building capacities in, in, in our partner countries, I think it's important to ensure that these initiatives really continues, but because they have shown to be very, very important. And uh, obviously we need, we need this to happen as close to where the data is produced as possible. So to ensure that it's really relevant. So that's one point. And the other one is really back to this storytelling part. It's, it's important to shorten then uh, the steps between those producing data and the policy makers or the facts and the policy makers and, and the, the citizens uh, to, to ensure that these uh, stories come out and, and um, uh, adds to this social uh, trust within uh, countries. But they, because that's really when decisions makers making is fact based, that's when trust is building in, in countries. And I mean, that's the basis of, uh, of development, really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I, I turn to Stefan uh, with a couple of questions, I just want to uh, share some of the questions we have received online and to see if at the end we have a couple of minutes. So any of you would like to to uh, respond to that. One is how can achievement of SDGs be incentivized? And another is the SDG indicators measure development outcomes. How can we better connect those outcomes to feasible policy? policies at the country level. And another question is, um, how can we alter the methodology in the context of COVID-19 impact on SDGs? So I'll just throw this open and then see which one of you would like to address. But now coming back to Stefan, um, you know, Stefan, you know, to, to communicate better with, with data is really important, but we also need to have the best data available in order for us to, to really uh, use and, and, uh, and turn them into insight and decisions. So in this regard, we're really facing fast evolving uh, uh, landscape uh, when it comes to data in terms of the uh, data technologies uh, that could be uh, adopted and in terms of the data stakeholders and the new data sources that we, we learning to, to, to make use of. Uh, so in this, in this fast evolving context, how do you see that uh, uh, more that UN and the World Bank can do in complementary ways to help improve data production use globally? Uh, no, absolutely. You, I think many of you have already pointed to the fact that, uh, I mean, the, uh, there is now, there are many data out there and uh, we do have also a new challenge, which is, I mean, uh, uh, to keep an eye on data quality. And of course, the official statistics that we are responsible for um, are sort of, I like to look at them as the backbone of a, a big ar data architecture that can be enhanced with geospatial data and big data. And, and you've shown how this can be done so that we can use all the data or universes that are out there in, in an orderly fashion 
uh, to inform policy decision making at all levels. And I mean, there are different types of policy decision making at the local, at the local, regional, global level, and they need different types of data and uh, timely data, disaggregated data. And I think. Uh, the national statistical offices have now a new role to play as data stewards. They, they have to make sure that the right data are being produced, are being quality checked, and are being communicated to the right people. So that's a new big task, and I think the national statistical offices are capable and all the nodes to do that, but they need our help. They need the United Nations and the World Bank to help them. They need to, to help in a technical advisory manner, and they need the financial support. They need advocacy uh, support so that they are uh, the, the light is shown on their important work. And I think in this, we can all work together. And I mean, the World Bank is a funding fa facility. So I think uh, we, we need to keep working on capacity building programs. We have blueprints. The General Assembly has adopted a Global Cape Town Action Plan, which basically articulates what national statistical offices need. So that gives us a guiding star. And if we keep working together, and I, I like very much, of course, also what Susanna was saying. I mean, because I mean, the World Bank uh, is one of many donors, is a very leading uh, donor. And I think what has happened in the last couple of years is that the donors came increasingly together in the field of statistics and made sure that there is a defectiveness, that we are not with all the good intentions stumbling one over the other and double covering one sector or one part of the world and others are literally left behind. So I very much welcome that development because we are all uh, uh, short of resources and uh, I think uh, this is an area where we can really work together a lot uh, more in the future to make whatever is available in terms of support and resources even more effective uh, to help the countries who have to ultimately be the fact checkers and 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 uh, uh, keep the quality control and of their data production now. Yeah, thank you. Since uh, you are talking about uh, this so enthusiastically, I will throw you uh, through a one question at you. This is a question we received from the uh, World Bank uh, live uh, platform yesterday ahead of the event. That is, what's the role of data in making our cities sustainable? And what are the efforts that are being made across the world to make sure that data play the pivotal role in sustainable development? I think you have talked about, you know, what you, you have just said, uh, mentioned uh, address the second part of question maybe you can quickly focus on what's the role of data in making our city sustainable well i think uh, i uh, the cities were sometimes not not on our horizon at the very beginning but i remember a moment when i was in your country and i was talking to the city responsibles in shanghai and at one point in passing they mentioned that there are 24 million people there and I suddenly realized that this is a lot more for them than in some of the countries in the world. So cities are important service providers, everything from transportation, jobs, health services, as we can now see in the middle of this crisis. And so so cities at the very local level, they, they are very close to the citizens. So I think they need to play an important role also. And we are bringing with our focus on the geospatial dimension, uh, I think we uh, we are bringing the focus really also closer to the citizens, and I think the cities are a very very important conduit. And I, I welcome very much the increasing engagement of cities and city responsibles also in our in our global discussions of what kind of data are needed, and how can they be part of this discussion that we we, we produce the right data in the right way. Great, yeah, thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left. Um, I wonder whether any of our panelists would like to respond to the question, the SDG indicators measure development outcomes. How can we better connect those outcomes to feasible policies at country level? Um, and Or how can achievement of SDG be incentivized? If any of you could uh, make some quick comments before we close. Yes, blessing. You know, I can make a comment about incentivizing SDG progress. 
um, four things come to mind. One is the power of telling stories. When Mr. Shaw was talking about attention yeah. spans, I was nodding my head vigorously because I think attention spans are already decreasing before COVID with social media. And in a post-COVID world, I think attention spans have gone down drastically. Mm -hmm. But there's something to said about the power of stories to really galvanize citizens. I think there's a, a huge opportunity for data creators to begin to work with content creators to think about storytelling to incentivize citizens. Mm -hmm. Supporting innovation is key as well. Mm -hmm. um, a huge role, I think, for the private sector to play in, in incentivizing innovation around the SDGs. I see such a huge role for private sector in health and gender equality and WASH, um, poverty and so much more. And so there's a huge role for private sector to play in supporting innovation. And then I think highlighting exemplars is key. Um, what are the best practices? What are the case studies we can show to try to accelerate progress? Mm -hmm. And finally, the power of partnerships. I think mm -hmm. the more that we can begin to hide the power of partnership, we will see some acceleration. And that's one of the things that Gobi really sets out to do. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, Shekhar or Susanna, you each have 30 seconds if you want to have one last word or uh, respond to any of the questions. Please, Shekhar. Uh, you know, another uh, area of great uh, potential is public-private partnerships. We've seen people like Raj Chetty in the U.S., for example, start using private sector data anonymized uh, appropriately. I think the bank can play a huge role in developing countries where administrative data are still very poor. And if we can get the MasterCards and the Paytms and a whole bunch of other people to start giving us data and the bank can kind of be uh, a, a good cop there in, in enabling that. I think that would just dramatically change the data landscape in developing countries and overcome some of the difficulties that national statistical agencies have. Thank you so much. Susanna, I'm glad you have the last word. Yeah, just really quickly, I think it's important to accelerate this progress to really look at the system, right? We've been talking about it uh, several times during this session. I really look at it as a sy system because the policymakers that are going to take the decisions, they're not dealing with one dimension. They're dealing with many dimensions that interact and they need to deal with them all at the same time. So the, the SDG Atlas will be one important to tool in, in that, uh, in, in, to see that reality better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, brought us to the end of this event. Uh, of course, I hate to close it, but uh, it, it has been such a fascinating discussion. I'm really glad the SDG Atlas um, uh, product has spurred so much um, insightful uh, discussions. And I really appreciate our panelists and also the, the online participants for sharing your questions and your thought. Uh, this just gave us such a boost of, of uh, energy for continue to innovate and to make sure that we, we we learn from others and try to stay at the cutting edge in bring data to real uh, to, into real insight and real uh, uh, decision making so that we can see that we not only manage the current crisis but also help the world help to guide the world towards achieving SDGs in the longer term so with that thank you all very much uh, for your participation this is really a joy uh, to be with you all and uh, thank you see you next time thank you Ashan. thank you bye bye good night bye 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 thank you bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.